I'm not going to do a technology uh, presentation. Um, I'm actually, you know, a marketing guy myself, and uh, I, uh, I thought the, the best thing uh, to do in this circumstance, you know, is to tell you a bit about our company, which is uh, to, to show you why we're interested in, but more than that, to share with you a lot of the insights that I got in working in China in the last year and a bit and uh, the tips that I wish someone would have given me before I entered the Chinese market. So uh, China is very different, and I hope you would find it uh, interesting. So um, how does China connect? The, the things that I want to cover in this short session is, first of all, tell you a bit about us, about visually. We're connecting offline and online. You heard the term O2O a lot here. It's uh, very important in China and worldwide to talk a bit about the Chinese digital consumer. I think you've covered that mostly in, in yesterday's session, so I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, then explain about QR codes a bit. Um, you've seen QR codes in the previous uh, presentation by Mobile Now. Everybody's talking about them. They're not such a huge hit, you know, in the West. And uh, it's interesting to understand why they, they have so much potential. And then the majority of the presentation is about connecting with your customers in China and targeting the Chinese market in a way that is effective, building on the presentations earlier today. So about visual leads. So we're connecting offline and online with visual QR codes and mobile experiences. So the visual QR codes, as you might have seen in the previous slide, is combining any image, logo, design, animation, and even video with the black and white codes in a way that creates a visual QR code that can be scanned by any QR code reader. So we're introducing color and movement for the first time in the QR code technology, which is crucial for O2O and mobile internet in Asia. Um, we're a small startup, 16 people uh, currently, but we serve over 500,000 business customers uh, around the world in over 200 countries including Coca-Cola and luxury brands like Yves Saint Laurent and Mont Blanc, Orange France, uh, Crocs, BMW, and many other brands. And we've won quite a few startup competitions, the Global Mobile Internet Conference in Beijing in 2013, uh, uh, Ernst and Young's competition, uh, Computer Vision competition, and I'm just coming back from Barcelona where we were a finalist in the Internet of Things uh, competition of 4YFN. Uh, um, the conference of Mobile Work Congress that deals with startups and what will happen four years from now. So they found us interesting. And another company found us interesting, which is Alibaba Group, where we invested um, last m two months ago already, a um, multi million dollar investment in our company um, to make us part of the Ali family. So it's an investment, we're not acquired yet. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it shows you, you know, that there's something interesting about QR codes and O2O that, that might be worth paying attention to. Now, this guy, this guy you, you might know him, right? You, you've seen his face here and there. But, you know, building on today's sessions, I want to give some perspective. So we talk about authenticity, and I'm an Israeli, it's all, you know, we don't have any other way. If we need to put up a face, we don't know how to. It's just uh, direct. Um, but uh, the brands also talked about, you know, a heritage of 300 years and businesses passing in the family and the values of the brands, etc. Just a comparison. This guy didn't get, you know, his family owns nothing. He didn't get anything from his parents. He was uh, a young 20-year-old uh, guy. He applied for a job in Kentucky Fried Chicken, and he couldn't get it. 24 people applied to the job in KFC. 23 got the job. He didn't. But he kept on, you know? And today, he started Alibaba in 1999. It's not, a, you know, it's not hundreds of years. 16 years ago. And today, Alibaba Group manages the world's largest two e-commerce platforms, Taobao and Tmall. They process three, over 300 billion euros of merchandise a year. 
This is 2014, and it's growing constantly. Alibaba is the biggest e-commerce company in the world. It's larger than eBay and Amazon combined, just in perspective. But this guy thinks long term. Like the brands that we heard here, he founded the company in 1999, and he said, I want to build a company that would last for 102 years, over three centuries. So he thinks long term. And he says, I'm not focusing on the immediate profit right now. I'm focusing on building tools and building an ecosystem that will benefit all the stakeholders and will become a huge business. And it already has become a huge business. So this is a bit about Alibaba. Alibaba is not uh, you know, in e-commerce. They just bought a travel company. They have a taxi company. In any business that you can think of that involves mobile internet, these guys are there or could be there after raising $25 billion in the largest IPO um, in the history of NASDAQ. So what, what's the problem that we are solving and got Alibaba interested? So how many of you know what a QR code is? Everybody, we've heard about them, right? How many of you scanned the QR code? Not everybody. Okay, how many have been to China? About half, great. So, let me drink a bit because I'm getting dry here. So, QR codes are extremely efficient. You know, they can do many things. They can get you on WeChat. They can get you to a web page. They can uh, facilitate payments. They can do awful lot of stuff. But they have an intrinsic problem that hinders user adoption in many other markets. You know, in China, they're extremely popular. But also in China, you know, they suffer from the same problem. They're ugly. QR codes are ugly. I once heard the Germans find them attractive. <laughs> but, you know, it's a matter of aesthetics, engineering. Some Germans find QR codes really cool. But essentially, you know, they're black and white, monochrome, kind of dull, and most of all, you know, and this is meaningful for business and engagement with people, they're meaningless. If we look at a QR code, we don't have a clue what it does, what it says. You know, a QR code encodes data. There's data inside, but no one knows what it is. Only machines can read QR codes. So people tend to ignore them because they don't understand them. And designers, you know, they're working on the branding and the marketing campaigns. You've all, your all marketing people did your websites and the brochures, etc. And the QR code doesn't fit, right? You know, you have your brand colors. This is black and white. You have engaging visuals. This blocks, you know, the, 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 the space. So designers push them to, to the corner, make them as small as possible to still be scannable. And, and as a result, people don't scan them enough. And this is the problem that we're solving. It's a great technology, a global one, which in China became very popular, and we can talk about that. And, but it's underutilized because of its limitations. And what we've done in visually through our computer vision uh, expertise is that we've introduced color and movement in the first time with QR codes, creating what we call visual QR codes. So it looks simple and intuitive. You know, you understand it. You see our QR codes, you see, hey, it's Weibo, Angry Birds, Facebook. I recognize it. But making it happen is actually a technological challenge which is very difficult. I'll just uh, give you an example of how difficult. When we enter China, a lot of Chinese companies try to copy us as you would expect, you know, and they've put hundreds of engineers on it because there are, you know, millions of engineers in China to, to do that. And some of these companies came back to us and said, okay, we tried to copy you for six months and we couldn't, so let's cooperate. Now, why couldn't they? Because there's, there are two challenges that are difficult to manage. One is it has to be visually appealing. When a human being looks at a visual QR code, he has to understand what he's seeing, like you know, um, you know, the, a logo of a company or a certain uh, a center, certain graphic. But at the same time, it has to work, because if it doesn't work, then what's the point? And our codes work across any QR code scanner. 
I don't need to know which scanner application you have on your phone, if it's WeChat or something else. Whatever you use with our codes would work, and that's the magic. And since we also own patents on this uh, innovation, then even if the big companies succeed in copying us, they can do it without you know, licensing. And this is why Alibaba found it very interesting. It gives them a strategic advantage in O2O that others could not replicate. And you can see that with video, it's really, really cool, because imagine TV advertising and digital out of home. So in China, in every building you go to, there's a, a, a TV in the elevator, there's a TV outside the elevator, and people are engaged with advertisements all the time. But until now, it would be a waste of space to put a black and white QR code, right? Because it's black and white, and I've invested in my video. But with video QR codes, you can suddenly both realize the space and get engagement directly from the screen. So I'll give you an example. If you're sitting at home in Paris and you're you know, seeing a, a, a Chanel adv advertisement, it will say, Chanel's new perfume. Now you need, and this is part of the advantage of QR codes in general. You used to need to remember, I saw this commercial, go on your computer or your other screen, search for uh, Chanel's website, click, uh, you know, like, a lot of different um, actions in order to engage with the brand. With the QR code, it's simple. You sit on your couch, you scan the TV, done, connected. So it's safe searching, it's safe typing. And when you have 5,000 Chinese characters to type, then typing is something that is difficult. So that's a bit about our technology. We also make mobile interactions more secure. Uh, so we make QR codes that are not only beautiful, they can also, also be more secure than black and white QR codes. And one example is what was talked here uh, with Hermes and uh, Bling Bling and the others is anti-counterfeit. So a lot of products are being faked worldwide. It's a huge problem. And when you're getting such a product or going to buy a product from a retailer that you don't know, you have very little way to know whether the product they're selling you is real or fake because the quality of fakes is also becoming higher. But what if you can, you know, if there was a visual QR code on the product itself or on the packaging that you could just scan and immediately see this is a real product or this is a fake product. So we do that. And because it's hard to replicate our codes, then you can't put the black and white QR code. The consumer would immediately know. And because we can do more things with the color and the algorithms in the code than others can do, then people cannot replicate the experience. But enough about technology. Uh, the digital consumer in China. So I think most of it was discussed yesterday. But I'll give you my short version. And again, I hate generalizations. So uh, forgive me when I say Chinese are, Chinese are. I don't believe it. There are many kinds of Chinese, like there are many kinds of French and many kinds of Israelis. But generalizations help us target large groups. So let's, uh, so we, we need to think about that. So, 700 million smartphone users. However, however you cut and dice it, it's a huge market. So if businesses like we heard here can make businesses outside of China from the China community, then obviously the China community in China is, awesome, is enormous. They're awfully connected. 81% of them use their mobile for connectivity. And it's a, a generation that almost skipped PC. It's like, you know, they had no connection, then they got a mobile especially for the young generation. And they're all on social media for many, many reasons. But two reasons are, two interesting reasons that I find interesting are one, that official channels and official publications and the government always gave them censored data. So it was always controlled. It was always formal. And suddenly, in social networks, everybody can express himself. And although there, there is some kind of censorship there, it's much more immediate. So people can get genuine or authentic messages there, and that makes a big, a big deal. And in addition, you spoke about the, the one-child policy. So hundreds of millions of Chinese grew up without a sibling. They had no one to talk with. You know, they were the darlings of their parents and their grandparents. 
but they had no interaction at home. And suddenly they make friends online. And Chinese don't only add people on social networks, people that they know. They add people that they don't know, complete strangers. You know, you shake your WeChat uh, and you find who's around you. Those are people around you that you don't know and you would still connect with them. And they trust whatever is coming from those people much more than they trust official channels or the brands. So this is a big part of why uh, social recommendations is so important. And they spend 40% uh, of their online time in social media, which we'll get to. And 82% of the Chinese consumers were influenced by social media in their purchase decision. So whatever is going on there translates to sale, and this is why social is so important. And one, one uh, generalization that I think it's important to keep in mind as a brand, also as a luxury brand, funnily enough, is that the Chinese audience is mostly young. You know, half of the Sina Weibo users, around 300 million people, are under 25. About 45% of the luxury brands consumers in China are under 35. So it's a completely different market than the one that usually shops at uh, Hermes or Louis Vuitton. These are young people. They don't know about hundreds of years of generations. They got their information about Hermes from WeChat and from Weibo and from videos. Most of them are urban. About 70% of the mobile users are in big cities. And again, even today, a lot of them are bored and spoiled. Bored and spoiled. So think about it. An only child growing up his entire life, his parents care only for him. His grand grandparents care only for him and put a lot of pressure on him, you know, to become successful, to be educated, to make a life for himself. It's a lot of pressure. And, and it's only them. So they're bored and, and, and they're looking for interaction. They're looking to relax on social networks. We go on social networks to engage. For them, it's a kind of relaxation. Um, O2O, so I, I, I told you QR codes are everywhere, I'll skip that. QR codes are far more, um, far more popular in China than anywhere else in the world. If here about 70%, you know in France, about 70% no QR codes and about 30% used QR codes, then in China about 92% of the mobile uh, internet, like the smartphone users, know what QR codes are, and about 70% have scanned them. And WeChat has a lot uh, to do with that. But more important for businesses, over 51% of the businesses in China use QR codes. Because if you want to have a WeChat channel, the only way to get there is through a QR code. And if you want to sell products on Taobao and Tmall, a QR code would get your, your customers there faster. And QR codes are are like on fire in China, growing in tremendous amounts. Okay, let me tell you a bit about my tips on uh, do's and don'ts in China. It's mostly from a marketing perspective, um, and I hope you'll find it useful. So I'm done talking about QR codes almost. Okay, so first of all, partners. You know, a lot of companies say we'll go to China and we'll find a local distributor or partner or a business development agency and they'll run China for us. It doesn't work. In order, to, in order to succeed in China, you have to be in China, in person. The amount of, you know, we had a partner like this and the amount of progress that we made when we came to China and met people face to face and developed relationships, which is the most important thing in Chinese culture, relationship between people, then you succeed. So partners are useful, but you have to be there on the ground enough. And if you want to succeed in China, you have to have a local presence in China. And this local presence doesn't mean that it's you, the foreigner, that sits there, but it means that you have Chinese people working for you in China. Brands. So Western brands are very tight about the brands. The, bear, the brand is 
is sacred, right? It's like religious. Don't touch my logo. Don't change my colors. It used to be RGB that, and you change it one point. Hell, I don't know what I'm going to do. Don't, no, don't put things too close to my logo. Don't, put, you know, don't change my title. This is a very Western approach. In order to succeed in China, you have to have a Chinese brand. Now, a lot of European brands come to China and they keep their old brands, but some find that they simply can't. So, you know, we have a complex name, Visual Lead. It doesn't work well in Chinese. We change to Shidrema. It's visual code in Chinese. But a more relevant uh, ex example for this crowd comes from, uh, um, from Mont Blanc, the, the luxury pens brand. And they had uh, a pe pen series for, you know, hundreds of years called Meisterstrick. German name, didn't work in, in China. So they changed it to Daban. Now, Daban in Chinese means big boss. The, they wanted to say, these pens go with elegant managers. And they created a new brand from scratch, no Meisterstrick, just Daban. And they, they made a whole social campaign about what a Daban is and how you become an elegant boss and what's men about you. And they had games, you know, where people would rank their friends, whether they're Dabans or not Dabans. Really great. So branding has to be Chinese. And also, you can see Yves Saint Laurent. You know, if we did that in France, made the Yves Saint Laurent a QR code with all these dots that are needed, you know, for the technology to work, probably some marketing manager here would have killed me on the spot. <laughs> but I'm standing here. And Yves Saint Laurent is a customer of ours in China. So they play with their brand. You know, you recognize the Yves Saint Laurent. This one takes you to their WeChat page. They let you follow. You see, it's their Weibo page leading to WeChat page because you have to be everywhere. And I think, you know, this innovation is, is meaningful. I think the, uh, another example that is irrelated is real estate. Like, think about what it would take to choose a building in Paris and tear it down. No, the unions and the heritage, and we're hundreds of years, etc. In China, every month that I come there, a new skyscraper is built, an entire skyscraper. And sometimes they ruin buildings that have been there for thousands of years to make room for novelty and innovation, to accommodate growth. And this is something that I think we all should learn from China. Yes, history is important, heritage is important, but there are many ways to preserve it. Language. So it turns out that uh, there's more than Mandarin. And since we have, as foreigners, no way to control for the quality of the translation, sometimes you give uh, you know, your uh, branding materials and collateral for translation, and you get out something that looks Chinese to you, you give it to Chinese people, and they say, this is not Chinese. I don't understand what's here. But more important on language is that official language is very different from young language. So if your customer is young, and they get something that sounds very dignified, very official, very hundreds of years old, they don't like it. If it comes from the official brands, they don't like it. Why? Because they feel it's like the, the messages we got from the government. It's like the sensor data. We want young, we want fresh, we want engaging, we want entertaining. So a lot of times there's a need to make sure that young Chinese people write your stuff in China. And, you know, I had an experience when I wrote a PR, and I thought, hey, PR goes to journalists, very respectable people, and it's going to be published in the press. The journalist came back, and it says, you know, this is too official, it's too heavy, I need, you know, something lighter. And it was an anti-counterfeit, you know, anti-counterfeit is like a heavy topic. No, you have to write it lighter, it's like, it doesn't fit me. And see what happens with emoticons and, you know, visual expressions. The Chinese consumers are inventing a new language, uh, inventing the, lan the language every day. There are new terms being used that have no sense in Mandarin, but they make sense for the internet generation in China. And as a brand, you have to speak that language. Social advocacy uh, we covered. Celebs. So 
you know, you probably know that the best way to drive advocacy and um, virality to your brand is through using celebrities. It's true in the West, but in China it's, magnif it's magnified. So if a person usually follows about 15 brands um, on his social networks, he follows 30 celebrities on the same social networks. So they follow much celebrities. And if you think about the, the, the notion of celebrity, why are celebrities so cool? It's because they are unique. You know, they are known. Think about what it is to be one person out of 1.4 billion people in a country. These are the people who made themselves known, who created the, a wealth for themselves and success. So celebrities are very important, but you don't want to use, usually you don't want to use Western celebrities that you pay, you know, in other countries. I'll give you the, an example. We went with one of our, of our customers to karaoke. It's a very, you know, nice activity in China. And I wanted to sing Britney Spears. So don't ask me why. So, <laughs> oops, I did it again. Anyway, I put Britney Spears on the KTV, and the girls uh, from the customer sit there, and they don't understand what it is. They don't know Britney Spears. They know Madonna. They know the Beatles. Britney Spears, a whole generation skipped. So Lady Gaga, maybe. But all the celebrities that are used by big Western brands in China are Chinese celebrities. They're not the Western ones. Beauty. In my first conference in China, I've made this poster for the backhand wall. I thought it's a beautiful Chinese lady that is wearing traditional clothes and she's showing innovation. So I thought she was the most beautiful girl I could find on Shutterstock. <laughs> you, don't, you disagree, I see. <coughs> Anyway, we go to the conference, and people are looking at us. Uh, we ask around, and we understand that this is the ugliest girl that I've ever seen, <laughs> and that she's we wearing a wardrobe of a waitress. <coughs> so this to them is an ugly girl, plain girl, you know, welcome you at the entrance of a restaurant. And we, when we wanted to position ourselves as a premium brand in QR codes, as a luxury QR code, then using an ugly girl waitress is probably not the best marketing decision I've done in my life. So beauty is different. Also, I, I would tell you appropriateness is different. No, I won't tell you that. It's a dirty story. Okay. So beauty is different. I'll give you another example of beauty. Websites. Who thinks this is beautiful? Raise your hand. This is the most visited website of news in China. This is Sina Weibo News. And this is Chinese UI. They find it helpful. It's a lot of information. They can find anything. You know, they love the colors. They love the, the busyness. Applications are also different. There's different UI for applications in China. So when you go there with your brand and you say, no, people are expecting to see KLM, they're expecting to see Hermes. Yes, but they expect it to see packaged a bit, bit differently. Maybe you can't go, you know, the full Monty to Chinese UI, but you should really pay attention and get some local agencies to help you bridge the gap in what Chinese are expecting to see in buttons, in colors, in structure. It's very different. Also, websites are not visited. Think about it. The first thing we do as marketeers is a website for our brand or for our company. But the Chinese internet consumers visit websites for only 0.5% of the time. 40% they're on existing channels like the social networks or the e-commerce platforms like uh, Alibaba's uh, Taobao and Tmall. So if you're a brand in China, you don't necessarily have to develop your website or your uh, application. You need to build on existing platforms and, and f put the content where the consumers are. Channels. So you need to be everywhere in social media, you know that already. But also there's a thing about exhibitions and offline and all kinds of innovative ways to get your customers. So this is an example that I like of a French company that we work with in Shanghai. And they took the men's toilets at all the high-end 
discotheques and bars and put TV screens at the top. So if you're, if you're targeting affluent men who, has, who have one hand free, they can scan a QR code. This is targeting, guys. This is innovation. Might be funny, but you know, it works. A lot of scans. People, it's captive audience. They're just there looking at your commercial. It's just one example, guys. But I, I got to say, you know, look at the, the offline world as well. I, uh, and, you know, study it carefully. Because one time I went to an advertising conference in Shanghai, and we set up a booth and everything, and we found out it's a printing conference. A lot of big printers. So you have to, be, you have to experiment, and you have to be selective. Foreign premium. Kentucky Fried Chicken is not a low-end fast food restaurant in China. It's a restaurant. People go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, and they say, you know, it could be a date for the evening. It's a valid restaurant. The fact that it's foreign gives it a premium. The same for McDonald's. It's not fast food. It's a restaurant. Carrefour, super high and supermarket, super high end. So the fact that you're a foreign brand already gives you points in uh, China. It's uh, very interesting to, to understand. And also, there's a value to fancy, which I think is very important for luxury brands. Chinese like fancy. There's, it's, a va sorry, it's a value. So an example for that would be that you can price your products completely differently. I think one of the reasons that the earlier speakers talked about Chinese people going to Europe to buy uh, um, luxury goods is that luxury goods in China cost more than in Europe. P a person would save his you know, annual salary to buy a Louis Vuitton bag. There's a value to fancy. It gives them an experience that I cannot understand, but it exists. And if you just take you know, the very few percentages of rich people out of a population of 1.4 billion people, you're talking about millions and millions of rich people. So I came to Shanghai, you know, the first time I thought, hey, I'm going to see a lot of poor people, etc. Ferraris in the streets and uh, the, the garbage people are carrying the latest smartphones. It's amazing. Uh, but also being foreign also comes with higher ex expectations. So you might have heard about the Procter & Gamble brand SK2, which is a skincare product. And in 2006, a Chinese consumer found out that they have some um, dangerous materials, chemicals in one of their products, and it went viral, and P&G had to draw all of its uh, products out of the shelves. And SK2 never recovered in China, never, because Chinese con consumers expect more from the, from the foreign brands. They might have forgiven a Chinese brand, but not Procter and Gamble. So it comes also with expectations. I'm almost done, so they want to be entertained. I'll skip that. Incentives. In order to get Chinese people to do something, you got to give them an incentive. It's not only about creating engaging co content. Many times it's about paying them or giving them presents. Like you heard about the red envelopes, but there's also other ways, like for example, in uh, Alibaba, in Taobao, they, they have promotions with big brands where each person who scans the QR code to buy something, just for the mere scanning, gets uh, five kwai. Now, five kwai is, I think, about 10, cent, 10 euro cents, something like that. So it's like nothing. Yeah, but it's nothing. But for many Chinese people, scanning those codes means money. And if you give them this small incentive, they would scan. So you have to think innovatively about giving people reasons to scan. And sometimes it's the interaction. This is an example of a campaign we ran uh, with Montblanc through a partner of us, DLG, which is a very cool uh, French uh, uh, digital consultancy in Shanghai. They also have an office in Paris, and they helped me a bit with this presentation. So I'm doing a bit of a commercial for them. But you see, this is the Daban that I talked about. You see, they took a, 
an old brand from uh, of hundreds of years, they give it a new look, and they also innovate around the technology with you know, the moon changing, and they had games where you match the moon movements and the clock movements. So you have to be really uh, cool and innovate all the time because young people are bored easily. So you need to always engage them. Um, and last but not least, of course, make it easy to connect. The fact that you have great content and you're in all the right places doesn't mean that they'll get to you. So, you know, make your visual QR code stand out. The same like the visual QR codes in social networks are the way to connect with one another. The, the same way big brands can use them in order to put, put them big and in the center and engage the consumers and get up to four times more mobile interactions. So, to sum up, if you want to succeed in China, I recommend you be in China and talk Chinese, which is, you know, like Chinese want you to talk with them. Innovate all the time, but on existing platforms, you don't need to build your own, and everything is different. Expect, expect many failures and many surprises as you go, and the last thing, have patience. Jack Ma has a, a very nice sentence saying, um, Today is hard, tomorrow will be worse. But the day after, there will be sunshine. And he knows. So thank you. OK, thank you very much. That was very interesting, uh, especially the anti-counterfeiting side of this. As someone who buys a lot of wine in Shanghai, and I'm always scared of it, I hope you're very successful in Bordeaux shopping this technology. I would be very happy to, to be more confident. Um, I know we're getting close to lunchtime, so are there questions uh, from the audience? We can just sort of go right to, or is everybody ready to, to have a break and get something to eat? Ah, here's one. Eileen, do we have a mic? Thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned you changed name when you started in China, where you, did you ask a consultant or did you just talk to your Chinese colleagues or did you pick up? How did you do it? So we're it took us ages at Figaro, our uh, um, digital website, it took us about four months to decide on the name, so, and it sounds really easy for you. Right, so um, you know, we were, at the time, we were a startup with very low resources. We couldn't afford an expensive uh, consultancy. I've worked at BCG, I know, you know, how much I would charge for such a project on the other side. It wasn't a possibility. So what we did is we came up, we had a couple of Chinese counterparts. We told them, these are our uh, values, you know, this is our technology. Come up with some names. And it turns out that most Chinese brand names are like two or three characters long. And you, you make different combinations of the same thing, and then you see whether it sounds good, whether it means something. And a lot of the Chinese brands also uh, reflect some of the values or the traits of the product. So we took uh, a couple of uh, teenagers and a couple of uh, people who worked with us at the big brands, and we said, OK, these are the 20 names that uh, we came up with. Which ones do you like? We took a survey, and the one that came up the highest was the chosen one. So it doesn't mean that you know it's the best one, but uh, at some point you just have to make a decision and run. The entire uh, decision on our China strategy that changed our fate forever, you know, uh, getting to all these large brands and the Alibaba investment was made in a, in a strategy process of three weeks. So as a, you know, as someone who came from BCG and corporates, I know that this is unreal. It's, uh, but startup is a different life. It's a different pace. Are there any more questions? I don't see any. Oh, here's one. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I'm interested in why Alibaba, you know, invest in you guys. And also, when are you going to see like your technology integrated into Taobao or I don't know the mobile apps? Are there any plan? Yeah. So our technology is already integrated uh, in Alibaba. You can see some of our visual QR codes on our homepage. And the first thing that we're launching with them is a service for all the sellers to create branded uh, visual QR codes for their Taobao pages. So it's already in works. And we're working with them on many other uh, um, projects like anti-counterfeit, for example, which is very strategic 
and video and mobile. So I hope uh, that you'll see a lot more of it soon. Thank you. Why they invested? It's because we're cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can see. I know you. I'm keeping you away from lunch. I'm sorry for that. Yeah. I'm hungry too. But you know, <laughs> but we're cool, really. Okay. Well, shall we end there then? And uh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.